church go through the Great Tribulation? Well, we've already heard from our Bible teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, that the church will be raptured. That is, it'll be removed from the earth before the tribulation begins. But for those who aren't sure or would like more convincing, stay with us today as Dr. McGee takes us through some compelling evidence in Revelation 7, verses 13 through 17. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word. Now, much of what we've been studying in the last couple of chapters have been very serious and maybe even a little concerning. So, before we get to our study today, let's hear Dr. McGee share something on the lighter side. I would like today to inject just a little bit of humor in our program. Every now and then, we feel like, especially when we're in a book like Revelation, where it's rather heavy, that we should bring this in. I have a letter that comes from a school teacher in West Orange, New Jersey. And she gives me a lesson in pronunciation. I think she's a very nice person to tell the truth, but she just can't help being a school teacher. And I would like to just call attention to the words and let her know that I'm studying her lesson. She says it's grievous, not grievous and it's deterioration and not deterioration. And I want to thank her for this lesson that she gave me, but I worked in Detroit as a young fellow with another young fellow from New Jersey, and he and I became friends because we liked to hear each other's particular brogue that we had. And I must say that I would like to have given the young fellow from New Jersey, a lesson in pronunciation also. So I don't blame this teacher for giving me this lesson, but it reminds me of the story I heard many years ago of the professor from a university in Nashville who went up into Kentucky to visit one of these Kentucky mountaineer boys, and this mountaineer boy took him out in his sweet potato patch, and he said to him, he says, I want you to come out and I want to show you my tater patch. And the professor thought, this is a fine opportunity for me to correct this man's pronunciation. So they were standing out in the potato patch, and the professor says, now, you don't really mean tater. He says, it's pronounced potato. And this mountaineer boy reached in his back pocket and pulled out a great big 44 rusty revolver, and he cocked it, and he says, Stranger, I call them taters. What do you call them? And the professor said, I call them taters too. So if you don't mind, I don't have a revolver, but I'll just keep on pronouncing as I always have because I've learned that pronunciation is really a matter of taste and of the location of the country that you're in. And so you will forgive me for not learning the lesson as I should. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that little bit of lightheartedness from Dr. McGee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us through your word, providing us the wisdom and knowledge for living a godly life in an ungodly world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're still in this very wonderful seventh chapter of Revelation. And it's very wonderful because it answers the mooted question about whether people will be saved in the Great Tribulation period. And to me, it also answers the question of whether the church is still on the earth. And we see that a great company are being saved. Fact of the matter is, two great companies, and they are both clearly 
identified. We saw a great company out of the nation, Israel. When I say a great company, I'm sure it would be considered just a remnant. But 144,000, they're very clearly delineated and designated here because 12,000 are taken out of each tribe and the tribes are identified for us. And then there was a great multitude and it was so great that no man, one man could number it at all. And these are out of all the tribes and peoples and tongues. And the interesting thing is that they are a group of Gentiles and they are saved. Now the church, you can see, is not here. The church was mentioned just again and again in chapters two and three, and all of a sudden it disappeared. What happened to it? Well, it left the earth and went to heaven because we see it now, no longer a church, but the 24 elders in heaven. And from here on, the church is just not mentioned. It's not the subject at all. If you were overhearing a conversation that was taking place in the room next to you, and you hear somebody talking to somebody named Bill, and it was Bill this, Bill that, Bill something else. And then all of a sudden, you hear Bill say, well, hello, Bob, and apparently Bob is coming to the room. And so Bob says, hello, Bill, and then you see Bob talking to the others in the room, and Bill is not mentioned again. Now, don't you assume that maybe Bill left the room and Bob came into the room? Well, when you leave chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, and the church is not mentioned anymore, you assume it's not there. Or if it is, you certainly forgot all about it, and it was very important. But somebody else has mentioned, Bob has come into the room, and Bill has left. The church is gone, and God now has returned to the nation Israel. And the Old Testament is just filled with prophecies, as we've seen, and as we've gone through, that God had given them there to be a nation forever. They are to be in a land forever. And the fact that you can come to the New Testament and write them off as having disappeared and that God's through with them, you have to contradict the whole tenor and tone of the Old Testament. Well, here they are. <laughs> I told you that the book of Revelation is like a great Union station where trains come in or an airport where planes come in. They come in from everywhere. And all the major themes of prophecy come into Revelation. Well, now, you would certainly expect Israel to be here in the book of Revelation. And lo and behold, here it is. And Israel's Israel. Now, if God had wanted to call Israel the church, I think he would have just said church because he was able to say church when the time came. Now the church is not mentioned anymore, and he's talking about Israel and 144,000 sealed a witness for him. And then a great company of Gentiles now are to be saved during this period. Obviously, witnessed to by the 144,000. And the thing that makes it extremely interesting is that they made it through the Great Tribulation period. They were sealed, and they got through the Great Tribulation period. Now, we find them standing before the throne. I think that we've moved now to the end of the Great Tribulation, and I think most of them were martyred during that period, but they endured to the end. Why? The Lord Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, speaking of this same period, he says, they that endure to the end, they'll be saved. Well, are they going to endure to the end because they gritted their teeth and sort of clenched their fists and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps? No, they didn't do it at all. They were sealed, you see. And here's a great company of Gentiles, and they're making it through. We also saw that in the great praise that this great company gave to God before the throne and to the Lamb on the throne, why they were joined by a great angelic host. And they praised God not for salvation because they're sinless creatures, they were not redeemed, but because of his wisdom, his attributes of goodness and power 
and all of that, and that he's worthy of praise and adoration. One of the elders wants to bring John up to date on what's taking place. Now I'm going to read verses 13 and 14, and if you have your Bible there and will follow along, you will see I make a few changes, not many, but we do try to clarify the language here. Let me read. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, These which are arrayed in the white robes, who are they? And whence came they? And I say unto him, My Lord, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is a very enlightening passage of Scripture, as you can see. One of the elders went over to John, and he says, John, who are these here that are arrayed in these white robes? And John says, Sir, thou knowest, or my Lord, thou knowest, as we have attempted to put it in the original. My Lord, thou knowest. In other words, this is an idiomatic expression. I think we have one that would match it. Somebody asks us a question, we don't know the answer, and we just sort of lift our hands and we say, search me, which means I don't know. And that's exactly what John is saying here. My Lord, thou knowest. You know I don't know. You tell me, because I don't know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. Now, if these people that are gathered here had been the church, don't you know that John would have known it? John wrote to the believers in his day. He knew about the church. He knew about the body of believers. And he talked about that great unifying cement that holds them together. The love of God means that they must love one another. And that we saw was demonstrated, and I read a little poem about that the other day to you. Now, John doesn't know who they are. In other words, John at this point is, frankly, an amillennialist. He doesn't know who this company is. And so the elder who represents the church knows, and this company is not one of them. It's an altogether different company. It's those that came out of the great tribulation. And doesn't that tell you that the church is not going through the great tribulation? This is a special company out of all tribes and tongues and nations that have come out of the great tribulation. We live today when God makes a division in the human family. One division is saved and lost, of course. That's the great bifurcation of the human family. But if you want a group division, you will recall that the Word of God has something to say about it. We are told in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, and I'd like to read that to you. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Paul says to the Corinthians, there are three groups over there. There are Jews, and there are Gentiles, and there is the church of God. Those are the three groups. And don't give an offense to any one of these groups. That's what he's saying to the Corinthians. That is one of the divisions that the Scripture makes of the human family. There are Jews, there are Gentiles, and there's the church of God. That is the division today that runs right down through the human family. Now we've come to a period when there's not but two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Where's the church of God? It went to be with him. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. They're with him now, you see, this peculiar group which he mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. So God today is calling out 
of the two divisions, both Jews and Gentiles, the people for his name that are different, the church. And that church will be taken out of the world. I don't like the impression given today by some, and it is a pessimistic viewpoint, that somehow or another today, God is failing. My friend, God today is doing exactly what he said he was going to do, that in this age, he would call a people out of this world to himself. And he's doing a lot better job at that than you and I think he is. In fact, as a pastor of a church, I didn't think he was doing very much. But I've discovered on radio as we've reached out across this land and now around the world, why we have discovered that there are multitudes that are turning to Christ today everywhere. And that's what others are reporting so that God's calling the people out of this world to himself, the church. Now, the church is not here. And John makes it clear, this is a group different from the church. They came through the great tribulation. Now, where in the world have we heard about the great tribulation before? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that uses this term. In fact, he's the one that gave it to us. Somebody thinks that maybe some rank, wild-haired fundamentalist thought of that term, but he didn't. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that thought of it and designated it. And he makes the statement in Matthew 24, verse 21, he says, and then shall be the great tribulation. And here in Matthew and also in Revelation, there is a way of expressing it that we just can't do it in our language. There is an article with the adjective great and an article with tribulation. And it's the tribulation, the great one. And that is given to us for emphasis. In other words, this is something that's different. This is something that is indeed unusual. And so John is here quizzed by one of the elders. And he's unable to identify this great company. John would have known them if this was the church, but it's not. And if they were Old Testament saints or Israelites, I think John would have known that. This company he does not recognize at all. And they are identified as redeemed Gentiles who've come out of the great tribulation, and their robes, which speaks of the righteousness of Christ, how did they get it? Because Christ shed his blood. And that's the only way in the world that you and I will be able to stand before God. It's because he paid the penalty for our sins. He died that you and I might live. And that is true of this group here also. God has only one way of saving mankind. It's always been true. And that's by faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let me read a couple uh, scriptures to you in this connection. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul tells us what the gospel is. Let me read it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. If your faith was an empty faith and not put now in the gospel, you're not saved. But now if you've trusted, what? Now what is the gospel? Listen to him. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. Paul says, this is not new with me. I never thought of it. It was given to me that Lord Jesus taught him out yonder in that Arabian desert for two years. And he says that he is giving them what he had received, how that Christ died for what? For our sins, according to the Scriptures, according to the Old Testament, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, this is the gospel. The gospel is not God asking you to do something. It's God telling you that he has done something for you. The gospel is not you giving something to God. The gospel is God giving something to you. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. How do you get it? 
by faith. That's the only way you can receive a gift. Suppose you bring in here a gift to me, and maybe by Christmas, while you come in here and you say, Dr. McGee, here's a gift for you. Now, what did I have to do to receive it? I couldn't say to you, I'll come out and mow your lawn. <laughs> but you'd say, well, I don't want you to do that. By the way, many of you, when you hear this, will wonder why I mentioned mowing the lawn. In California, I have to mow my lawn in November. And so I say, I'll mow your lawn. You say, I don't want you to mow it. This is a gift. I'd insult you if you brought me a gift and I'd try to pay you for it. Suppose I'd say, well, I've got three cents in my pocket. I'll give you this for it. Well, that'd be an insult because I know you wouldn't give me a gift that just costs three cents. You see, friends, the things got all mixed up today. The gospel is what God is doing for us, you see. Now he says again in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. God's got plenty of grace, and I don't care who you are, he can save you. Now, we have here this great company that's not part of the church, and we need to enlarge our conception of the redeemed to the extent that it goes beyond the borders of the church today, and certainly beyond the borders of your little group or my little group, or your denomination, or mine. Now, verses 15 and 17, I'm reading in my translation now, and this brings the chapter to an end. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And I know now good and well that it's not the church. The church is never identified with a temple, and we're told when we see at the end of this book the church in heaven, in the New Jerusalem, there's no temple there. The church will never have a temple. There's going to be one here on the earth, but there's not one in heaven where the church is. So this couldn't be the church, you see. And he that sitteth on the throne shall spread his tabernacle or tent over them for protection, you see. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike upon them, nor any heat or scorching wind, that is, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them into fountains of waters of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, this company, they've had it. They've been through a great tribulation period. Most of them, I think, martyrs lay down their lives for Christ, although we're not specifically told that, but they are presented to us as being before the throne of God in heaven. And the things that are mentioned now are things they endured. They're not going to hunger or thirst. They apparently did. They've been out in the burning heat of the sun. And they also have been thirsty for spiritual things. And they didn't have that. And they wept. Now God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And they've made it through the great tribulation because of the blood of the Lamb, this wonderful company that's presented to us here. You see, he has other sheep. He told his apostles, it is hard for them to get it. I have other sheep that you don't know anything about. They're not of this fold. He has other sheep, and he could say that to the church. I have other sheep that you don't know anything about. And here are some of the other sheep, by the way, that have been redeemed, but it's not the church. I trust we've made that clear. We must stop at this particular point, begin at chapter 8 next time, and until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee was uniquely gifted in making difficult parts of Scripture come alive. And that's our hope and prayer as we travel through the pages of Revelation, that you're able to understand God's Word in a new and meaningful way. If that's true for you, We'd love to hear your story, so contact us today, won't you? And you can call us anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE and just leave a message on our listener testimony line. Email us at biblebus at ttb.org or even send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. 
And if you'd like to share God's Word with the important people in your life, let me tell you a couple of free resources available on our website, ttb.org. First of all, Dr. McGee's messages in this five-year study of God's Word are available to listen on demand. Second, anyone can hear or read the Bible in more than 800 languages when they click the Bible in Your Language button on our website. Visit us online. Again, the address is ttb.org. Now, until we gather again in Revelation on Monday, I'm Steve Schwetz praying that God's great grace, mercy, and peace would be with you every moment of every day. To be my own, sin had left a crimson stain. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.